maybe we'll get started. So um, if you're ready Sounds to go. Good. <clears throat> Great, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, Eli Neusner, President of Young Israel. Um, <clears throat> Rabbi Hellman is, as you know, away on vacation. So uh, in, his, in his absence, it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Uh, Keshet Star is the CEO of the Organization for the Resolution of Aganut, which is the nonprofit organization that addresses the Aguna crisis on a case-by-case basis worldwide. At Aura, Keshet oversees advocacy and early intervention initiatives that are designed to help individuals who are seeking a Jewish divorce, along with prevention initiative, initiatives to eliminate abuse from the Jewish divorce process. Keshet has written for publications such as <clears throat> Times of Israel, Forward, Haaretz, and frequently presents on issues related to Jewish divorce, domestic abuse, and the inter- intersection between civil and religious divorce processes. She's also authored academic work focused on get refusal and domestic abuse, and is a Wexner Field Fellow. She graduates from <clears throat> Michigan and University of Pennsylvania Law School. She lives in central New Jersey with her husband and three young children. So, Keshet, uh, on that note, please uh, take the floor. We're really excited to uh, have you join us this evening. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I actually spent a Shabbos at the Young Israel of Brookline years ago visiting a dear friend, and I just remember it being such a warm community and so welcoming. And so it's a real treat to be with you here virtually, and God willing, one day we can do in-person things again, too. And so hopefully we can follow it up with a a face-to-face one day. But um, essentially, yes, I mean... In our time together today, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to the GET issue. I think we all know, I assume, a lot of the basics about how it works. But what I want to look at more specifically is how do these big messes happen? How do these really problematic cases develop? How do they go off the rails? We are then, once we kind of outline the problem and we're all feeling a little depressed most likely, will then kind of shift to the more optimistic take, which is also what we can do about it. Because one of the reasons that we, one of the reasons that we at Ora love doing this community work is that while this is a really difficult and a really painful problem, there is also so much great work happening to make a change and so much that we can all do to make a change. So our goal always is to really find partners in this work and help you understand, A, what's the problem, so that you can understand more importantly, what are some of the solutions. I'm also thrilled to be able to share the floor a little bit later with Shauna Giora Gorfain, and I apologize in advance, I'm probably butchering your last name. Um, but sure everyone Sha- listening to this call who's known me for 15 years would do the same. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, I'm relieved to hear that. Um, but Shada has been just such a wonderful colleague for years, and so it's an extra icing on the cake to be able to hear from her today as well. And, um, and one thing I'll add as well is that I do love interaction. I know it's a little hard on Zoom, but if there's a question that pops up while I'm speaking, feel free to raise your hands, which I may or may not see, but there might be a raise hand option under reactions. And also feel free to just drop a question in the chat. We'll have time for questions in the end, but I would love to be able to have a back and forth if we can. So let's go ahead and jump in. I always try to find a balance where I don't want to be telling you a hundred things you already know, but I do feel that assuming knowledge doesn't always work either. So I'm gonna start with just a a very basic intro to the get issue, how it develops, and then we'll go into some of those, you know, how do these problems get so messy kind of questions. So one thing I always like to start with is the difference between civil marriage and Jewish marriage, because I think that's really a foundational distinction that helps understand why we have this rule that's hard to understand that creates a lot of problems. And essentially, in a civil marriage, if you think about a wedding scene in a movie, at the end of the ceremony, the officiant always says, you know, by the power, you know, vested in me by the state of Massachusetts, I now pronounce you man and wife. And we don't really think too much about that line, but that line is actually important because what it tells us is how civil marriage works, which is that in the civil system, marriage comes from the state. 
the state gets to decide that you're married. And if things don't work out, you know, poo poo poo, God forbid, the state is the one that also gets to unmarry you. Everything is top down, it's coming from the state. And just like you apply to the state for a marriage license, you have to apply to the state for a judgment of divorce, which is a literal piece of paper that you get at the end of the process. And so a lot of times we don't realize how ingrained that model of marriage is because we're so used to seeing that movie scene. But the truth is that Jewish marriage is structured in a totally different way. And essentially, this is going to sound unromantic. I always like speaking to lawyers about this because I feel like lawyers can get past the, the anti-romantic part of this a little better. But in Jewish marriage, it's really more of a contract. And before that sounds, again, super unromantic, you could frame it as sort of a, a meeting of the minds. There's a moment of agreement that what happens in Jewish marriage is that the rabbi doesn't actually marry you. He's there to make sure that you know what's happening, which I'll say as a side note, I often feel like us Jews could use wedding rehearsals, but since we don't have them, we need the rabbi to tell us where we're supposed to stand and who's supposed to go where. But essentially in Judaism, you marry yourself. And just like the couple make an agreement that, hey, we want to be married, and that creates that status, you need another agreement to say, hey, we don't want to be married anymore, to then cancel that status, which is something that lawyers like as well, because one contract cancels another, and it all fits together very nicely. But essentially, that's sort of the fundamental problem we're dealing with at ORA, that we have marriages, we have a contract, we need a second contract to end the marriage. Normally, the one thing everyone can agree on is that they don't want to be married anymore, and we can get that second contract without a problem. But sometimes that's not the case for a lot of reasons, which we will definitely get to. And one thing I'll say as well, I think a lot of us know get refusal bad, you know, so it's not a good thing. But we don't always fully understand why it's such a big deal and why it's so bad. First of all, not only can you not remarry without a get, but in most parts of the Orthodox community, you can't date without a get. So there is really no amount of moving on that can happen without that get in your hands. And in addition to that, if someone says, oh, well, get schmet, I'm just going to move on with my life and sort of ignore that nonsense, they can do that. But as we all know, if they have a new relationship and they have children in that relationship, those children will be mamzerim. They're going to have very problematic Jewish personal status issues. And a lot of people don't want to sort of put that burden on their children. And so essentially get refusal, while it might seem like, okay, so you remarry later, really the psychological and social impact of being denied a get is much more serious than that. And the word that we use for someone who's a victim of get refusal is aguna. I just realized I'm a little shadow, so I'm going to see if I can adjust my lighting while I talk. Um, but essentially, an aguna comes from the Hebrew word ogain, which means anchor. That an aguna is someone who is kind of anchored, weighed down, doesn't have freedom of agency and freedom of movement, and is really stuck in a relationship that is no longer a living thing. So then the question is, how does this happen, right? We're, a community that tries to do good things and how do these cases get to the point where they become aguna situations. And um, essentially there are a number of components to that, but I think the best way to explain it is sort of this dual process that's going on. That there's the, the secular divorce system, there's the religious divorce system, also known as the Beaton or religious court system, and then there's the intersection between the two and all of that creates a lot of complications. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of an intro to the Beth Din system. What a lot of people, including people in our own community, don't realize is that there's almost like this shadow system of Jewish law that operates in the world, that has its own courts, its own procedural rules, its own substantive rules. It's a whole body of law that is out there and active that many people don't really think about until they're actually in a process where they have to encounter it. One thing that makes the Beaton system in the United States super, super challenging, and it, believe me, it has its own problems in Israel, but they're almost opposite problems. But if anyone's interested, I can talk about that a little later. 
Um, but one of the things that makes the baked-in system so challenging is that it's entirely ad hoc. There's no accreditation. There's no association of religious courts. Nothing like that. Anyone can open a baked in. I used to say that all you needed was three people and stationary, but sometimes they just skip the stationary. You don't even need that. All you need are three people to say, hi, we're a baked in, and you are one. And so the problem is that you have enormous variability among the religious courts. There are some that are super, you know, procedural and responsible. And there are some that are operating out of someone's garage and taking money over the table, not even under the table. And you have everything in between. So it is very much a sort of buyer beware kind of situation where if you don't know, and we'll come back to this later, so it's partly why I'm mentioning it now, if you don't know which religious courts you should be going to, you are gonna get into trouble very likely because there is such a variety and there are so many bad actors out there that you can get yourself into trouble. Another factor, and I think Boston is unusual in that there's a big din of the city. There are several cities that have this, but most cities just have a marketplace. There's no big din of Brooklyn. There's a big din on every block and you have to know where you're going. And a city-based baked in can have its own challenges in some cases, but at least there's a clarity about where you're going, which in the New York, New Jersey area, we don't have at all. Another challenge that happens are forum battles that essentially the way that the Jewish legal process works, if one person approaches a Beth Din and says, hi, I wanna to go to this Beth Din, the defendant, the person who's being called to that hearing, doesn't have to go to that Beit Din. In Jewish law, the defendant has the right to choose an alternative, to say, you know what, I'd love to go to Beit Din, but I'm not going to yours. And so you can get into situations where a couple gets caught in a stalemate where they cannot agree on where they're going. They're really sort of stuck at loggerheads. And if they can't move past that, a case can stay that way for years. We also see a lot of issue battles. And these are cases where one person wants to go to Beijing to pick up their get. And the other person says, oh, you know, I'd love to go to Beijing, but I'm going to Beijing for everything. I want to do custody and financials there as well. And here again, even if they agree on the beat in they're going to, if they can't agree on what they're going for, once again, you have a stalemate, you have loggerheads, and either you break the stalemate or you get stuck in that for years. And what makes this situation so complicated is that most people are not just dealing with court or just dealing with beat in, they're dealing with both at some form, at some time, in some capacity. And in this case, you have two situations, you have two systems, essentially, that are each super complicated, but that don't have the faintest idea how the other one works. A court doesn't know anything about the baked-in system for the most part. A court can't separate a responsible baked-in from sort of a rogue baked-in. And similarly, while there are some bate-din, some religious courts that really understand the civil system, there are many courts that don't care about the civil system. That's the guy and that's not what we do. And so you end up with people who are almost being like caught like ping pong balls between these two systems and have very few people to go to who understand both. If you're getting great advice from your lawyer and great advice from your rabbi, but neither one understands the other process, you can end up in a pickle because you're following an incoherent strategy. And another layer to this problem that we see is just the lack of information. That the very basics of how a baked in system works. They send three summons letters and then they send a warning letter and then they issue a serif, which is a contempt order. You now know more than most people in the firm community. And that's including people in more ultra orthodox communities. And so you have a system that people really aren't familiar with, don't understand and they now have to navigate it. And it's really hard to get good information on what the rules are. Can you sign whatever you want to get a get and then go to court and throw it out? You can't, but a lot of people think that you can. And so you have this just difficulty in getting clear information that makes this super hard. And just to illustrate this, I'll share a, a quick story. There's a woman we worked with at Ora, we'll call her Hannah. Hannah was married for about 15 years in an abusive relationship. 
after, again, many years of this abuse, she decides, okay, it's time to leave. She goes to a battered woman's shelter. In the shelter, she works with an attorney to file for an order of protection. And then a few months later, when her life calms down, she decides to pursue again. So she approaches Baton A, which is known for being really responsible and reliable, and Baton A reaches out to her husband. And her husband says, oh, I'd love to go to Baton, but I'm not going to yours. I'm going to Baton B. So then Hannah calls Baton B to just get more information. Who is this forum? How do they work? And Baked in B says, well, there's nothing to talk about until you remove that order of protection because that was totally inappropriate. And now Hannah is kind of stuck. First of all, you can't just remove an order of protection yourself. That's not really how that works, but the Baked in doesn't know it. And here again, Hannah's comfortable going to one Baked in. Her husband wants to go to a different one. The odds of those two courts being able to cooperate when they're so different in terms of their standards and procedures are really low. And again, you're stuck. And these cases can stay this way for years and years and years. And they're very much a contributing factor to why we see Aguna situations, that because you get to get through the Beijing in process, because the Beijing process is so complicated, that is part of the reason why so many people struggle with obtaining a get. And so just to kind of shift for a minute, now that we've outlined a little bit about the process, how it gets kind of messy, I want to shift to sort of the why, right? Why wouldn't you just give a get? The marriage is over. Everyone wants to move on. What's going on when someone says, no, nope, I'm holding on to this? And the truth is there are a number of different reasons that were given. When I started at ORA, I was a case advocate. So I spent hours a day talking to get refusers and heard a lot of these reasons repeatedly. Some of them will say, I'm holding on to the get because I love her and I want the relationship to work. And in some ways that's a hard one because emotionally we can be sympathetic to that. I mean, that's really sad. In other cases, they might just purely say it's out of spite. One of our advocates was speaking with the get refuser and really trying to get to what's the hold up, what's the why. And at some point, the guy said, listen, I, this isn't going to sound very nice, but it just makes me happy to know that she's suffering and it's because of me. And so you have those. And then you have the, um, the most common by far, which is extortion. And that's a case where the person is saying, listen, I'm not withholding a get, God forbid, I am thrilled to give you a get. There are just a couple of things that I'm gonna need in order to feel comfortable doing that. And typically those couple of things deviate from what the law would allocate from what the law has allocated. And this is hugely problematic because when we talk about get refusal, we're often talking about who are the Agu note who have been waiting 10 years in the really sad stories. But what we don't talk about and what I think we need to talk about are the many, many women who don't get to that point because they give things up. They say, you know what, as long as I have my get on my kids, I'm good. Except the problem is if you come out of a marriage without any financial security, it's really hard to get through the next 10 and 20 and 30 years of your life. And so this extortion piece is so fundamental. A, we feel very strongly at ORA that this is like a very bad way to solve problems and we don't recommend it. Um, but it also impacts Jewish divorce in a very broad way that every Orthodox couple going through a divorce, it's almost like the get is just hanging on the wall and we all know it's there. And we should think about the way that motivates behaviors and decision-making. But to kind of shift back to those three reasons, right? So you have the love, the spite, the extortion, and yet there's really a common thread underlying all of those. And that common thread is control. Because if you think about it in every one of those examples, control is kind of the beating heart. In the love case, which again, I think we're all sympathetic to, it, the person is still saying, this relationship isn't over until I say it's over. And the fact that you don't want to be here anymore, that's not super impactful to me because until I call it, this is an ongoing marriage. And the spite case is also very much about control. I feel like you wronged me and I'm going to decide what your sentence is. I'm going to decide what punishment you deserve for these things that I feel like you did to me. 
And in the extortion case, again, it's fundamentally about control. I am the one that's going to decide what this divorce agreement looks like. And there is no one, no rabbi, no attorney, no judge that is going to make a decision because I have sort of the golden ticket. I have the, you know, Willy Wonka golden chocolate bar in my hand. And until I get what I want, you're not getting it. And so for that reason, one of our, our central messages at ORA is that get refusal is not just a, a, a rude thing to do, but it's domestic abuse. It is absolutely a form of spousal abuse, just like any other form. And I think in a lot of ways, it's a particularly insidious form because it's also really a form of spiritual abuse. And spiritual abuse is when you sort of take religion and spirituality and you weaponize it. You almost put a, a sword or a gun in its hands and send it out to do bad things. And the emotional impact of this is so significant. Being hurt by the person who once said they were going to love you and take care of you is very traumatic for everyone. But when the way that you're being hurt involves religion and Torah and halacha, that is extremely alienating and extremely traumatizing for people to go through. And I always emphasize this spiritual piece because I really truly believe that get refusal is a spiritual problem that also requires a spiritual solution. And we see that when Agunot are in communities where they feel like the community is supportive of them, checking in, you know, that the community is also outraged about what's happening, that is a game changer compared to people who don't have that support. And I also feel like this is a critical issue for everyone who cares about Torah and Halakha to get involved in, because these are situations where Torah and Halakha are being manipulated into weapons that they were never meant to be used as. And all of us who love Torah and Halakha should say, no, that's not okay, and we can't tolerate that. So I think that um, that element is so fundamental. And the last thing I'll say just before shifting to interventions is, you know, who cares what we call it, right? Why does it matter so much if we call it abuse or we call it just like being mean? And I think there's two reasons why it matters. Number one is equivocation. I used to talk to get refusers all the time. And many of the conversations actually began kind of bizarrely with them complimenting me. They would say, oh, all right, you guys are doing such great work. I gave you $18 five years ago. Like keep up the amazing, you know, efforts. And I think get refusal is terrible. And you know, those real get refusers out there, they should get into a lot of trouble. My case is a little bit different. If you knew my ex-wife, you'd understand. And I had this conversation not once, not twice, but more times than I can count. So at the end of the day, if we don't say as a hard line on a policy level, this is not okay ever, everyone thinks that they're the exception. Everyone thinks that they're the 1%. So for that reason, we need a clear cut policy and calling it as abuse, which is absolutely what it is, helps us get that policy. And then the second piece is that calling it abuse makes it accessible. Very often courts are kind of allergic to religion. They don't want to touch anything religious. That's not my job. But when we frame this as a form of domestic abuse, it allows judges and attorneys and other players in the divorce world to understand why this is so serious. So once again, I think we sort of outlined and we could talk about this for hours, but I think we have a pretty good sense of what the issues are. And I want to then shift to what some of the interventions are and sort of do that by telling you a little bit about ORA and the different prongs that we use to address this issue. And so first of all, just a background about us. We started as a college student group that eventually turned into a nonprofit organization. So uh, your extracurricular clubs really do matter and you never know where they can end up one day. And we have four major program areas. And the first, and what we're probably the most well known for, is our advocacy work. We work with about 75 women at a time, also a few men, who are trying to get a get. And when we say sort of what we do, the truth is it really varies. We will do anything that doesn't violate civil law or violate halakha. So we don't beat anyone up, and we don't do anything that would make the get considered invalid under halakha. 
within those boundaries, we do whatever we think is going to work and whatever the aguna or the agun is comfortable with. And sometimes that's something super in your face, like a demonstration outside their house or a social media campaign. You might have seen our flyers going around. And other times it's really behind the scenes, opening up communications. In some cases, it's getting the get refusers counseling so they can help themselves move past this sort of very stuck impasse that they're in. And so the techniques really vary. But one thing that we're very committed to is having very much sort of a, a client centered approach that we really try to put the person themselves in the driver's seat and also being really creative that every case is so different. The cases that get to our advocacy team are high conflict, really difficult cases. And so just making sure we're being really creative in how we address them. The second piece of our programming is a helpline. And we started this because we looked at our data and we saw that people were calling us about three years into the divorce. And at that point, they had already made a lot of decisions like which bait am I going to that couldn't be unmade? And I sort of analogized it. It was kind of like walking into a room covered in broken glass and getting out, you know, a broom and a dustpan. So we thought if we can just get there before the glass breaks and keep it from breaking, that would be so much more significant. And another thing I mentioned earlier is just the lack of information. No one really knows how this stuff works. It's really hard to get good information. So part of what our helpline does is talk to people in the very early stages, in some cases before they've spoken to their spouse, and just help them understand how the system works. Because again, to uh, forgive me for using two analogies within the space of two minutes, but it's kind of like showing up to a baseball game if you don't know how to play and you don't know which direction you're supposed to run in and you don't know what you're supposed to do at the bases. You're probably not going to win. And so part of what we do is give them that kind of baseball primer so that people can then make decisions from a knowledgeable place and make decisions that really line up with what matters the most to them. In addition to that, we also run educational programming. So just like this, we speak to schools, we have a program for high schools, we have a fellowship for college students, we do a lot of legal education, rabbinic education. We really go to everyone who is kind of a stakeholder in the Jewish divorce world. And a big part of what we advocate for is the universal adoption of the halachic prenuptial agreement. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend sort of too much detail going into exactly what this is and how it works. But I'll give you sort of the cliff notes of the halachic prenup because um, the halakhic prenup, I think, is the biggest area where community involvement makes such a difference. So essentially, when you sign a prenup, you're agreeing to two things. Number one, you're agreeing that in the event that there's a disagreement about the get, you are going to send that disagreement to a specific bait in. Typically, it's the Befton of America in New York. You can also adjust for other forums. Now, a lot of times people don't get excited about arbitration agreements, which makes sense. But the reason this is so exciting is that we talked earlier about the forum battles and the issue battles that can add years to a high conflict divorce. The prenup essentially avoids that. <clears throat> By having the couple decide in advance, this is where we're going, you really circumvent an enormous amount of challenges. And the second part of the prenup is that it enforces a support obligation, that it's kind of creatively worked out. It can't be a penalty for halachic reasons. So it's structured this way. The idea is when you are religiously married, you have obligations to each other, right? Halachic marriage is not just about all the fun things you get, but also what you're obligated to do for each other. And the idea is that as long as you're living separately, but you're still halachically married, you owe each other. Again, there is a version that goes one way. A lot of couples who come to us prefer a version that goes both ways. The idea is that for every day that you kind of drag your heels on the get, you now owe $150. And that adds up to about $54,000 per year. And it basically creates a financial disincentive to delaying the get. That if I'm going to have to pay money for every day, I don't really want to do that. 
So the reason, and this might seem like a super random solution to a high conflict and, and a really complex problem, but the reason that we like it so much are that first of all, out of all the legal remedies out there, and there's fascinating scholarship on, you know, what are the legal tools to address this issue, et cetera, contract-based remedies seem the most promising. That when we think about the many halakhic issues involved and the many constitutional issues involved, a contract that both people voluntarily sign is sort of the golden standard. It's the best and easiest way to really bring those two systems together. <clears throat> the second piece is that, as I said earlier, it is civilly enforceable um, and it is a binding arbitration agreement. So just like you might sign an arbitration agreement with an employer, it kind of falls under that spectrum and it's enforceable as an arbitration commitment. I see a question, are they recognized by all US courts? Every state has slightly different models on this. Shauna can speak to Massachusetts law. Some jurisdictions have their own prenup version. So California, California signs more prenups than any other country in, than any other state in the country. They have an entire body of prenup law and there is a separate version for California. There's a separate version for Canada. There are versions available in other countries that address the legal structures in those countries. And so you really do see variation, but it is generally enforceable. I've never seen it not enforced when properly signed. And I would argue that in some ways, the real strength of the prenup is not the individual, but the group component. That for an individual couple, we always hope that of course they won't need the prenup. And that even if they do get divorced, if they're getting divorced with a prenup, it'll go smoothly. But I think the biggest difference is that if you live in a community where everyone signs a prenup and it's just a thing, and it's sort of a given that you're going to be doing this, that's not a community where you wanna be a get refuser, right? The costs are going to be too high. So by having sort of an across the board model where everybody signs this, you create a system where we're all kind of agreeing that we're not okay with get refusal here. That in, you can try that somewhere else, but in this neighborhood and you know, Young Israel or Brookline, we don't do that. And that sends a very powerful message and we really see how much that impacts behaviors on the ground. And one story I'll just share, we were approached about two years ago by a young woman who was coming out of an extremely physically violent relationship, also lots of other forms of control, every red flag that we would expect to turn into an Aguna situation. And her husband was actively saying, I'm not giving you the get until you can't have children any longer. And that's what he was sort of flat out telling her. And then it happened to come out as we were speaking with her that she had a prenup. And we talked her through how to actually enforce the prenup, connected her with an attorney who specializes in the prenup because this was a case where we knew the husband was contesting it. And we got a call about three weeks later, thanks so much, I got my get. And at the end of the day, we would not have gotten that phone call without the prenup because another strength of the prenup is that the prenup changes the whole timeline. In a lot of situations, you end up in this circular logic where someone says, oh, I'm not withholding a get, I'm just waiting to give a get later because I just wanna like see how other things turn out. And you end up with this sort of softball extortion kind of dynamic that no one's really openly acknowledging. And the beauty of the prenup is that the prenup ties the get to separation you're living separately, now you do the get. And what we really see, again, we specialize on our advocacy team in extremely high conflict, very complex divorces. They get worse year after year after year. You would much rather deal with a contested get three months post-separation than five years post-separation. And we really see how profound that difference is. So by encouraging the get early, by tying it to the end of the marriage, as opposed to the actual civil divorce, we save ourselves a lot of stress and chaos. And the last thing I'll mention as well, and I'm gonna peek at some of these questions, 
We also do a lot of work in helping couples sign the prenup. That the prenup does have to be notarized. That can feel kind of intimidating and scary if you haven't, you know, gotten life insurance or done anything else yet where you wouldn't have needed that. So we have a, a one-stop shop for couples to come in and sign the prenup. Right now that consists of connecting them with online notarization resources and other things like that. We kind of mediate between couples that don't agree on signing the prenup or that aren't comfortable with some of the language. And that's super interesting because you also really get to see if there might be other relationship issues that are under the surface that the prenup is bringing out. And we also help people figure out tricky jurisdictional things. I live in New Jersey. I'm getting married in Michigan. I'm planning to make Aliyah this summer. What on earth do I sign? That's a complicated question because you do have different prenups in different areas. So we help couples kind of figure all of that out. So the last thing I'll share before I turn it over to Shauna, and then I see some questions in the chat, so I think I will address those after Shauna speaks um, when we get to the question part. Um, but the last thing I'll share, first of all, COVID, of course, has really impacted all of this work. Bate Din are behind. Courts are so behind that I don't even know what they're, I don't even know how that's going to work in terms of catching up. That's going to be really interesting to see. Um, it, so many custody arrangements have become complicated. Social support, feeling like you have people and a team around you is so deeply impacted right now for Agunot. We're actually working on adding sort of a fifth prong and starting a support group for Agunot because the need is so great right now. And it's a really difficult moment. And my hope, because I always love silver linings, my hope is that I think we've all experienced in the last few months how it feels to be stuck, how it feels like there's a big pause button on your life and you're waiting for someone to press play so you can keep it moving. And my hope is that that sort of collective experience will give us all some empathy for the people that we work with at Aura who live with that pause button for months and years and in some cases decades. And I think it's such a critical message for us to talk about as communities because there is really so much that we can do. And I've been involved in this work in some capacity for 10 years, and it is not the same world now than it was in 2010. It really isn't. And so I've really seen how much that communal investment and energy makes the difference. And one thing I always share as well, at Aura we have seven staff members. Um, seven prenups are not going to change the world, but it's only when you sort of join with us and help spread the word and mention it at Shabbos meals and tell your niece who's getting married. It's that involvement and investment that actually allows this to sort of catch on and to really make a profound change. So that's just one of the many reasons why we love being able to come and share. So I know there's a lot of information. I'm going to pass the floor to Shana, who's going to share a little bit more about Massachusetts law and the Boston Agrona Task Force. And then we'll go back to some Q&A. And I see we have some great questions in the chat. So looking forward. Hey, well, thank you so much, Kesha. Of course, I'm sitting here scribbling because half of what I had written down, I no longer need to cover. But I pretty much, I should have expected that to begin with. Um, but. Anyway, I'm a member of the Boston Agana Task Force. I'm the, I, I'm basically the legal touch point there um, because I'm also a practicing divorce attorney, which I think most people attending this know. Um, the Boston Agana Task Force actually started several years ago with a similar goal to Aura's education and promoting the um, RCA's binding arbitration agreement, colloquially, colloquially known as the halakhic prenup. Um, and oh, I see another question there about a postnup. Yes, we can we can get to that too. And we discovered that as much as we were hoping that this could at least solve the problem for the future, there were still two big reasons why the existing Agana problem just wouldn't go away. I mean. Of course there are. One was the reality that many of the divorcing couples had gotten married before this agreement existed or when it wasn't really a thing. I remember when Julian and I got married 18 years ago, this was odd and new and very few people had seen it. It existed, it wasn't brand new, but it wasn't as common. Um, 
And then the other one is that there's just a lot of resistance in certain communities to having couples sign this agreement. I know there are a lot of modern Orthodox rabbis who insist on it. Um, and there are a lot of rabbis in other communities who don't bring it up or actively discourage it, um, view it as unnecessary interference in the process. And so one way or another, we end up with a lot of divorcing couples, specifically divorcing women most frequently, who are stuck and are trying to not become agunot. Um, at the Boston Agunot Task Force, one of the one of the main things that we've developed over time, and this is really a brainchild of um, Leia Lipsker, is a website called getyourget.com. And it provides uh, a form for submitting questions that then get relayed to the right person, depending on whether it is a question of my lawyer doesn't understand X, Y, Z. Well, that will come to me. I can talk to this person's lawyer. Or halakhically, how do I handle this thing? How do I first approach the Boston Baked Inn? It, different things go to different people. I've been in Aguna for five years now. What do I do? So we have that website. And that website also includes um, different sorts of sample language that people can just print out and bring to their lawyers um, or point their lawyers to for different points that they might be at in this process. So again, as Keshet mentioned, we always try to encourage divorcing couples to handle the get as early in the process as possible. Um, it is my understanding that many Bate Din, and I know the Boston Bait Din, will handle get delivery and then they hold the get itself. And what they say is when you are civilly divorced, then you can have the receipts and you know everything get everything gets released. And now can, you're free to do whatever you want, but in the meantime, we have this get that has been properly delivered and we hold it in escrow so that nobody can say, well, I don't want to give her the get now because we're not really divorced yet. What if she runs off and gets halakhically remarried before we're civilly divorced? Well, we're going to sort of take that out of the equation also and get this done, but hold on to it so that it's not, um, so we can reassure you that that's not what's going to happen, even though that's not really something, um, again, it comes down to that same issue of control. So one of the, again, one of the pieces is that online website. Um, we also are working on, I know Kesha talked about an Aguna support group. We are starting to work on something somewhat similar, sort of a friendship network within the community. This is really in its infancy stages, but we're hoping to develop that sort of connection often um, especially if you're from a community where divorce is really frowned upon um, or where perhaps there might be more support for um, bringing all of the issues to baked in or giving the marriage a second, third, fifth try. Um, it might be helpful to reach out to another person or sometimes just to get through each step of this process. If your whole friend network has been through your married life, you might need some new friendly faces and voices in your life when you go through this process. Um, and so people who can be appropriately trained in how to be supportive and then really just be friends to get to get all the way through. Um, and particularly because going to baiting can be a harrowing experience. Um, we, all, we do try to ensure that women who want to have accompaniment to baiting can have that. Um, it is not always possible, but it's something we try to make happen as well. Um, I'm not sure what else there really is for me to say about the Aguna task force that isn't sort of covered by similar work that Aura does, except that we are more locally based. We do um, work with Journeys to Safety and Jewish Family and Children's Services, so there's sort of referrals back and forth there as well. Um, and then the last piece is that we are also starting to try to work on education to, for lawyers and judges in Massachusetts. And I know that Nkesh is smiling because we were talking about trying to do this on a wider scale as well. And this goes back to the concept of control, which is just another word for emotional abuse, which is that has been a long 
educational process in the legal community to begin with. This concept of control really being a form of domestic violence. Um, now we need to tie this concept of get refusal back to the control issue and say, this isn't a religion issue, Your Honor. This is just another form of emotional abuse. So that's another piece of what we are working on. Um, I know there was, Kesha, if you want me to just start with that jurisdictional question, if that's okay, um, because I know somebody asked, I don't remember who it was, about is this enforceable in all jurisdictions? And I know that Keshet mentioned that some of them, um, there are some variations on the form. So California has a different form. Um, but generally speaking, it's a private contract between two individuals. Um, we call it the prenup or sometimes call it a postnup if a couple is signing this after they're married because we think of it in terms of being tied to the marriage and then later the end of the marriage but it's a private contract. In some states, you enforce that private contract in the same place you enforce, uh, same place you go to for a divorce, and it's very, very easy to keep it all together. In other jurisdictions, and Massachusetts is one of them, it can be a little bit more complicated, but that doesn't mean that it's not valid, it's still an enforceable contract. Um, and it really just comes down to a question of strategically, what is the best way to approach it? And usually the best way to approach it is, well, there's community saturation. Everybody signed this thing. You really want to be the guy who didn't do what everybody else says they're going to do. So that's the other way to handle it. If you really want it to be airtight, the way to do it is to have a full-on premarital agreement before you get married or a full-on postmarital agreement where each side goes to their own lawyer and the lawyers draft up a full contract and there's full financial disclosure. And that contract can say that you're putting off decisions about alimony or child support or custody or whatever until the time of the divorce. That is a little bit stronger, but it's also not something that most people wanna do, especially you know, young firm couples don't wanna go through all that. Nobody has a ton of their own assets maybe or they really just want to do this as a show of community support. So while as a lawyer in my own business interest, I'd love to recommend that um, as a practical community matter, that's not a realistic expectation. Um, I think we'll open it up. I don't know if somebody else is monitoring questions or if but I should. Should we jump in, Ali, or do you want to call specific ones out? What works best for you? Um, you, Eli, do you want to go through the questions? Yeah, so um, looks like did you, um, there, were, there were five or six questions in the chat that you guys addressed. I'm happy to uh, pose these. Um, I'll also just add, sorry to interrupt, but I have a number of questions that were sent privately as well. So we can okay. kind of piggyback and I'll, I'll make sure to mention those. Okay, so great. Let's start with uh, the following. Um, well, here's one interesting issue. If a man refers to a woman as his ex-wife, if that was witness or witness, couldn't that be used uh, as evidence of a directive to give a get in front of a baked in? So it's a great question. I would say on a more meta level, the question that we get around this is sort of, are it like we're Jews, we're smart, aren't there creative ways to get around this get stuff because it creates so many problems? And it's a totally fair question. The problem is that when it comes to keeping kosher, for example, right? If I follow a different rule than you do about like chicken cleaning or something, unless we're having a lot of Shabbos meals together, that doesn't have to be a problem. But when it comes to being available to marry other people in the community, you start running into a lot of difficulties. So there's a real need that any creative halachic solution has to have enough buy-in from really senior religious decision makers in order for it to work. And you have an element of sort of political elements here that not everyone loves the idea of sort of changing things that are in the structure. Any changes that have to be implemented have to work within the structure as it stands. And so this is an area probably more so than many others, where the gap between theory and practice is really significant. And even if an idea is like a gold star on a theory level, unless it's going to work on a practice level, it is probably not going to be 
providing meaningful alternatives to people in this situation. So, I mean, that's sort of like a, a general answer, but that it is very difficult. There are ways to get annulments. They're extremely limited, extremely politically complicated, but for the most part, you really need to get, and there aren't great options for sort of getting around that voluntary giving up the end. Do you have, um, do you get the sense that there, or do you see like ever uh, like uh, baked in shopping where let's say whether it's the wife or the husband are actually looking for uh, a specific baked in that might be a little more amenable to their case? A hundred percent. We see couples that live in Teaneck and someone's showing up to a, a Bell's based in. Um, we definitely see that. So there's a lot of based in shopping. It's a huge problem and a lot of shopping not you know for good reasons but for you know feeling like you're going to get what you want out of this forum or this is a forum that's not going to be understanding of domestic abuse or understanding of whatever issues are at play yeah and i would just uh, jump okay. in there i would jump in there and say that as a general rule um i would recommend and i think many other people would recommend that before you agree either in your binding arbitration agreement or in a stipulation that you're signing early in the divorce process or anything else to a particular baked in um, to do a little bit of research. I don't know if Aura um, fields calls about particular bate din. I, I know that if messages come through, I, I'm not sure who provides that information. It's certainly not me, but um, the, we sometimes try to suggest that people see if they can go elsewhere. Um, and the fallback is often, if we can't agree on a baked in, you know, one side picks a rabbi, the other side picks a rabbi, and then they pick a third. Yeah. And one thing I'll say about Bate Din in general, that I prefer institutional forums as opposed to Rabbi X's baked in, because the problem with a Rabbi X baked in is that if Rabbi X, you know, gets older, is not as involved in the day-to-day -day workings, you can end up having the bait in run by sort of like a shadow leader um, that has very different policies and different attitudes towards things. And they often don't have the same infrastructure. So the reason we like Bati Din, such as the Bethden of America in New York, or, you know, the Boston Bethden, is that these are institutions with a board, with oversight, with staff, they keep records um, that can be very unusual sometimes. And so I would tend to steer people towards an institution over an individual, but it depends. And I have a Hasidish baked in that I refer people to because they do a good job. And if only a Hasidish baked in is going to get the job done in that particular case, we do need to know who those are. So we try to just keep track of who's out there and what outcomes the people who have called us have had with those forums. Speaking of um, Hasidish, the uh, question comes in, why does Chabad encourage halakhic prenup? Great question. I always say that you kind of, Chabad are so hip that sometimes you forget they're Hasidish and then this issue comes up and you remember that I think this is an area where you see more of that Hasidish mindset but it's changing and it's shifting. We have an enormous number of cases in the Chabad community that has led to inroads where Chabad rabbis realize, oh, the prenup might feel icky because you know we don't want to think about divorce, but having a six-year Aguna case in Crown Heights is also icky, um, and that can change dynamics. And we're actually actively working right now with a number of people in the Chabad community to see if we can move that forward. Very good. Um, question comes in from one of our listeners who apparently signed a post nup some years ago, but is that really a thing that works? Yes. So, oh, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. I was going to say it's basically the same thing. It's a thing that works. I mean, again, it, it's a private contract between, between two people as long as you acknowledge that you're talking about the marriage that happened before we signed this, um, as opposed to some future marriage. So there is a different form from the RCA, um, but if you happen to have the other thing, you go in there and cross out any of the other references, but better to use the right form. But I mean, people have post-nuptial agreements independent of the Agrina issue as well. Um, it, it is something that couples do. There's no reason that it's an issue if you do it afterwards. And it's a great show of support community-wide also. Um, I've, I've been, you know, one of the resident notaries at a post-nup party, so. 
I will say also, I didn't know about the prenup when I got married, so I have a post-up. But one thing we love about the post-up is that social piece. I didn't mention this earlier, but our messaging around the prenup is that you're not signing it for yourself. You're signing it because someone out there is going to need it. And as, you know, Jewish people, we believe in, you know, Ko Yisrael, Ari Vim, and we're all connected and all responsible for each other. So we try to really frame it as prenups are something that happy couples do to help, you know, make this a norm so that the people out there who need it are going to have it. And we've had couples who have been married for 50 years sign a post op And it sends such a wonderful message that it's like, we've literally been married for 50 years. We know each other. This is not about being insecure in a relationship. It's about wanting to make a difference on this issue. Hmm. That's good. Maybe that can become a thing. Um, question is on a technical question. Does the divorce have have to happen in the same state in which the prenup was signed? No, not at all. Divorce it, divorce jurisdiction is generally, um, I mean, I don't know what the law is in all 50 states, but generally it's if you both, if that's where both of you were living, last living together when you were married, usually that's a state that has jurisdiction. When you have a situation where, you know, one person picks up and moves out of state and it's two years later, that's more complicated, that's a state to state issue. But in all of these situations, it doesn't matter where you were when you signed the contract. Um, I do think, and I don't know the particulars of the California form, which again is the one that sticks out differently with the RCA. And I think that one is very geared toward people who um, are getting, might be getting divorced in California, but also California is a community property state, I think, which, which affects some of the division of property issues um, if you live there at any point in your marriage. But it doesn't matter where you were when you signed it. And one thing I'll add as well, uh, just good to know, just as a framework, that the law in general favors contracts, right? Courts want people to just get out of court because courts are already busy. So there's kind of a, a built-in bias towards upholding a contract because if every single contract from buying your house to selling your, you know, really old Honda, if every single one of those contracts is going to get taken apart in court, that makes life very complicated for everyone. So we kind of get to ride the wave of, you know, upholding contracts more broadly in this particular situation. Okay, great. Let's uh, take one more question, which um, actually a very interesting angle is the, we know that the incident is far less, but we almost never hear about men who are refused getting can you address the differences and how that is handled and particularly as it relates to your work? Sure. So I will say for us, we see about 95% men refusing, 5% the opposite. I know that in Boston, there have been different numbers. So there, this definitely varies. And also our name says a note. And so I am sure there is some bias in terms of the people calling. The reason why we see more in one direction are first of all, a lot of people don't know that a woman can refuse to receive again. It's kind of like a fun fact. So part of it could just be that people aren't doing it as much because they don't even know you can. They didn't know that they had this uh, great tool to harass their spouse, you know, and they gave it away. Um, but another part of it is that we, the, when it comes to the issue of Manzeras, right, future children having personal status problems, that only applies to women, does not apply to men. In addition, there is an option for men to get what's called a heter meirabanim, which is like a permission slip to marry a second wife. If you're not super sketchy, it's actually very hard to get this. But if you are both sketchy and wealthy, then you can get this. It costs a lot of money, and it's only from like one very sleazy guy in Monty. But it can be done. And so I think that those kind of different realities just lead to us seeing more numbers in one direction. But in practice, if we're working on in a goon case, it functions very similarly. It's, you know, domestic abuse happens across genders and it's absolutely someone using it as a power and control tool. And so there might be more education involved in, in explaining, yeah, this is a thing um, when we're out there spreading the word. But um, that's why I think we see different numbers people report a variety of numbers, and I imagine the way that people understand you as a resource really shapes the kind of people that are calling. Excellent. So um, I understand there are actually a couple of questions that have been directed to you privately. So um, unfortunately, I have to drop to get on another call, believe it or not. Um, but I will be happy to let you kind of continue to answer those questions. 
Uh, I have to apologize for leaving early, but again, this has been really thought provoking and compelling. I really appreciate your coming to address us tonight. And on that note, I will let you continue with um, some other questions. Thanks, Sounds everybody. Great. And I'll also put my contact information in the chat. And so if anyone has more questions or wants to ask anything privately, you can. And we are, I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes, but I, I will not be offended um, for people who need to zoom off. So a few questions we got personally. I got, I got personally. One question asked why major rabbinic organizations don't publicize lists of reliable Bate Din. That, you know, why isn't there a way to make this easier? And the really tricky thing is that, first of all, many rabbinic associations have a Bate Din. And so they're not really neutral players in the game. So the Rabbinical Council of America, for example, is the parent institution of the Befton of America. Um, and that is not uncommon. So part of it is that they have their own bait in. So you people might see it and say, oh, of course they're suggesting themselves. That's not very exciting. But I think a big challenge is that for people, for one bait in, you still have to be able to get along with the other courts in the sandbox, so to speak. That if one bait in says, you're not legitimate, I'm going to ignore everything you say, that baked in is going to do it right back to them. So even for us, we will answer a thousand phone calls. Is this baked in good? Is that baked in good? We will not post that publicly because we need to be able to call a terrible baked in and say, hi, Rabbi X, how's it going? Like, hope you had a great weekend. And we have to be able to do that in order to serve our clients and our constituents. So there's kind of this, it sounds maybe a little phony, but there's kind of this element where I always try to separate issue advocacy work in a broader way from individual advocacy work. So I think if we were only doing issue work, we would absolutely be interested in being a lot more blunt about what's good and what isn't good. But because we do individual casework, we have to be careful and we have to be able to get along with the forums out there. Another question is, um, I'm sure you're aware of networks to support abusive husbands in get refusal and what can be done. This is a huge issue and I think a growing issue. The internet has done many wonderful things for humanity, but one of the downsides is that it has allowed for a number of sort of hate-filled subcultures to really flourish. Um, and the religious men's rights world, I think is one of them. Um, Again, I think the concept of religious men having been denied rights is something you'd have to like either be on board with or not. Um, but we do deal with that a lot. We're pretty aware of a lot of the hate groups out there. There are some hate groups that repost everything we post with snarky comments. And we monitor them regularly just to check if our cases are on there. Because if they are, we have a better sense of where the case might go next. Um, but again, I think it's very important to realize that what a get refuser and their supporter is usually really good at is making things super complicated, almost presenting it that unless you, you know, random person in shul, unless you're willing to read 500 documents from the litigation and talk to 25 people, you can't have an opinion. And what we really push back on is the idea that get refusal is domestic abuse, and therefore it's never okay. And therefore, I don't need to read 500 pages of litigation in order to know that, what, that what's happening isn't okay. So I think that we really need kind of a security as a community that we can take a stand on this, and that this is not such a complicated issue that we can't have a moral line in the sand. Um, I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but yes, we're actively aware of those networks and doing what we can to really not give them credibility. We try not to like feed trolls, so to speak, and we try to really be aware of what groups are doing, but not give them more credibility than they deserve. Another question is, does a prenup have to be notarized everywhere? This again might vary by jurisdiction. Overall, what I've been told is that notarization is kind of like the icing on the cake that you can make a case that it's still a valid contract without it. But again, what lawyers specialize in, and uh, 
this makes us extra fun to be with, is that our job is to think of all the bad things that could happen. So we're imagining that A, you get divorced, and B, it's a bad divorce, and C, you're contesting the prenup, and C, or D, you're standing in front of a judge contesting the prenup. And so we want you to have everything you could possibly have in your arsenal in that situation, which hopefully should not happen. So it's a little far-fetched in that you would actually need to enforce it in that way, but part of, you know, I'm a lawyer by training, so, I have to be like an Eeyore about these things sometimes. And we really just encourage people to do it as well as they can. One thing I'll add as well, which I forgot to mention earlier, is that we have an online registry for prenups. And so does the BDA. And so we have a lot of lost prenup situation, less more recently in the age of smartphones, but a while back, people would say, oh yeah, I totally had a prenup, but I don't know where it is. So it's always good, even if you don't sign it with us, you can send us a copy, we'll make sure it's in our registry. And again, we say that the best segula for not needing a prenup is signing one, and we hope that you'll never need it. But if you do, we want you to be able to access it. Um, someone asked about a post up, which I think we covered. I got another one, if you get a prenup while living in one state, but then you move to another state, does it ever make sense to sign a postnup targeted at the new state? Great question. I would say it depends on the state. If you're moving to California, and Shauna can back this up because Shauna is the, the real litigator in the room, I would say if you're moving to California, get yourself a California prenup. Like that is going to translate much better. If you're moving to Israel, you may want to get one. One of the challenges is that Israel now has about five prenups that are competing for precedence. It's sort of like a fight club of prenups going on. And we're gonna have to see over time which ones are universally signed, but we're doing a lot of individual coaching with people to make decisions with regards to Israel because the US-Israel shift is complicated since the legal systems are structured so, so differently. Anything you wanna add to that, Shana, that I'm missing? Um, no, that's, I think mean, that actually pretty much covers it. I mean, again, the usual advice is, well, when you get to the new state, talk to a lawyer, but nobody wants to do that. <laughs> but yes, if, if it's known to be a community property state, then probably a new agreement is good. But at the end of the day, what I think it really comes down to is if there's going to be a problem, then whatever pieces of paper you have to back up original intent are helpful. Um, and even if there's a technical issue with a document in whatever state you happen to be in when you're getting divorced, you still have it to bring to court and say, but look, this is really what we meant to do. And also, here's why it's emotional abuse. And also, here's why you should do this, Your Honor. I mean, that's just everything you can do to help helps. But the main force here is if everyone signs it, then it, you just you'll be excluded from your community if you're the one jerk who doesn't want to cooperate in the process. Totally. And one thing I'll add as well, if you have, you know, $30 million in assets and you're getting a secular financial prenup, you can incorporate the halakhic language into that prenup. And that's something that we've counseled attorneys on who aren't so familiar with the halakhic side, but are working with clients. So you can always squeeze it in there, you know? There's no need to choose between the two. And I would, I would add in for that is that we similarly have language to do that if you have somebody who's pushing on the I don't want to give a get at the beginning of the divorce process, mm -hmm. we do have language, we have recommended language for putting that into a stipulation that the parties sign early in the process about this is the language that goes in if you then want to put it off until the time of the divorce agreement. And it all, this is really a, a situation where if the lawyer does not know exactly what they're doing, you want to have them talk to somebody like me or somebody like Cash Ed or somebody else at Aura who can help craft the language because what you don't want to do is risk the get itself possibly being considered invalid because there was a direction in a civil document to give a get. So we have to use very clever language like the parties agree to go to binding arbitration to this particular arbitrator, which is the Boston baked in or whoever, and that party X is going to cover all the costs of this. And, um, you know, it's for the purpose of delivering a get, but it's not specifically to give a get. And then additional enforcement can come from the baked in um, issuing repeated summons or sending a report back to the court saying the person's not in compliance. 
it, it's technical and tricky, um, and that that's the part that I love, but probably beyond the scope of this. For sure. We got another question in, I heard a few years ago, that there's never been an unresolved Aguna situation for couples that signed the RCA prenup. So here's what I will say. When it is important, and again, we're talking about worst case, worst case, that it's properly signed. There's a case that I know of where the notary made an error. They wrote that it was notarized on, you know, Monday, June 21st, but there was no Monday, June 21st of that year. The husband in this case had actually had a traumatic brain injury and could not be examined as to his intent at the time of signing it because he wasn't able to speak to that. They ended up litigating it for over two years and the court ended up enforcing the prenup. And essentially the day that what was now, you know, $200,000 needed to be transferred over, the get was given. So again, in that case, it worked out. It didn't work out immediately, but that was also, again, there was an error and you had this extremely complex situation. One thing that I do think is important just to be aware of is that the prenup is designed for get refusal, not for classical aguna situations. These are cases where someone is so mentally incapacitated that they halakhically cannot give a get. These are cases where someone is in a coma, where someone went on a sailing trip and never came back and no one knows what happened to them. Those are classical aguna cases and the prenup is not designed to address those cases. However, I would say that the classical situations are pretty few and far between. And I really think that if we address the majority of Aguna cases with the prenup and prevented them before they happened, I think we would be able to see more rabbinic flexibility for that minority of extreme cases, because there's always a lot of fear about the floodgates. If we sort of come up with this creative you know, strategy in this case, is it now going to be misapplied? So I would say there's still a huge value, even if the prenup ultimately is only gonna cover 97% or 95%, I still think that there is a huge value in focusing the resources and attention on that 3% as opposed to everyone. And I will say, and I think like you mentioned this earlier, Shana, just that once there's a prenup, it kind of takes the get off the table. I worked on a case once where she had a prenup and lost it. We didn't even have it. And I was speaking to the husband's rabbinic advocate who was telling me I want this for the get, I want that for the get. And I said, and I used my words carefully, and I said, you know, there, they, there, was, there is a prenup, like they signed a prenup. And the rabbinic advocate was like, oh, there was a prenup? Okay, fine, we'll do it Thursday. And just like fold it, you know? And granted, like we didn't tip off that we didn't actually like have it, but I think that it sort of shared, that's how the prenup works. When you sign a prenup, we tell people sometimes that they're nervous when they come to sign it. The only thing you're giving up by signing this document is the opportunity to be a jerk about the get later. So if you want to keep that opportunity, then we'll let you guys talk for a few minutes. But that's it. That's the only thing you're leaving on the table. And it really means that if you decide later, actually, I do want to do some extortion here, you've lost that opportunity. And people don't, aren't happy to hear that in some situations. But I do think that ultimately we're all in a much, much better place when we're letting people solve problems in sort of a fair and an ethical way, as opposed to using the get as this kind of sledgehammer that ends up leading to pretty poor resolutions. So I think that is everything. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of you for staying on so much extra. I know everyone's so busy, but it was really such a pleasure to connect with everyone here. And, um, and again, I put my email in the chat. Our website is www.getora.org. And there's a lot of information on there on ways to support our work and get involved, volunteering. We have a lot of different opportunities. Um, and we're very active on social media. So follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And yeah, this was such a pleasure. And I'm so glad I was able to connect with you and looking forward to having some new partners in the fight against get refusal. And thank you, Shana, for sharing and teaching and bringing some of that 
you know, Massachusetts information for us. And we love the Boston Agudat Task Force because there's no replacement for something local. Everything that you can do, I think, is a thousand times more powerful when it's local. And we love supporting, you know, we have an organization in Australia that we've been working with. We love supporting people who care about this work and are making it happen on a local level. And we think that's awesome. So it's always a pleasure. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, I don't know. Am, am, I, am I here to close us out then? I guess then I'll thank everybody for coming. Um, and I, I think this is the first of a series. Oh, Carrie is here. <laughs> Carrie, can I bounce it to you to close us out? Because I don't know who's next in the series. Um, I don't have the information at my fingertips either, but there are two more of these. And this one was fantastic. You, you two set a really high bar. So I hope the other two are, are half as interesting and enlightening as this one was. But um, a crucial I, 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 I guess I just have to refer people to the emails and Facebook for the info on the other two. Herschel Schachter is speaking next week. Thank you. Sounds great. Well, thank you so, so much for having me. This was really such a pleasure. Have a great night, everyone. Good night.